In today's video, we are going to be tackling everything that you need to know about gluconeogenesis. This is brought to you by Dirty Medicine. If you like my channel and you want to support my channel financially, please click the join button. You can find the join button underneath every single video on my channel. And if you go to the description of any video on my channel, it's the first link in any description. When you click that join button, you're going to be a Dirty Medicine member, which means that you'll pay $4.99 a month, which is securely paid through YouTube, of course, which is owned by Google, so it's very safe. And in exchange for that, you'll be a Dirty Medicine member. When you're a Dirty Medicine member, you get the awesome Dirty Medicine logo after your name when you comment anywhere on the channel. And you'll also gain access to the locked community tab section of my channel where you can comment or post requesting the topic of my next video. Thank you very much for your support or your consideration. In today's video, we're going to be talking about gluconeogenesis. Let's start with an overview and then we'll do a high yield rapid review where we run through the pathway and I'll point out the few things that you guys need to know so that you can go into test day feeling confident that you're gonna get 100% of your questions on gluconeogenesis correct. So just as an overview, Gluconeogenesis is the process by which the body maintains euglycemia, which means keeping blood sugar levels within the normal physiologic range, and that euglycemia is maintained by producing glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. Gluconeogenesis occurs mainly in the liver and the kidney, and it occurs both in the cytosol and the mitochondria. This pathway typically occurs during fasting when the body needs to continue to make a source of glucose but doesn't have any input glucose. Now, of note, skeletal muscle cannot undergo gluconeogenesis, and that's due to the absence of glucose 6-phosphatase, which is a key enzyme involved in gluconeogenesis. The way to conceptualize gluconeogenesis is to think of it as glycolysis in reverse. So to refresh your memory, in glycolysis, you start with glucose, and you end with pyruvate. And in between, there's all these messy, nasty looking steps that most of which you actually don't need to know for USMLE or Comlex. And then once you have pyruvate, that pyruvate can be shuttled either to lactate through the Cori cycle or to alanine through the Cahill cycle. There are also other destinations for pyruvate, but those two cycles allow you to convert lactate or alanine into pyruvate and once you have pyruvate, you're really in a flexible position because pyruvate can enter any one of those pyruvate pathways, or in the case of gluconeogenesis, you can go back up from pyruvate back to glucose. And in this process, you'd be able to synthesize glucose potentially from a non-carbohydrate source such as lactate or alanine. So in gluconeogenesis, I'm gonna make a blanket statement here. It is glycolysis in reverse. So every single step going back up from pyruvate back up to glucose is going to be the same exact step in reverse that you saw in glycolysis. The only exception to what I just said are three steps. So going from pyruvate back up to glucose, everything is the same as glycolysis, just in reverse with the exception of three steps. And because only three steps are different, you only need to know these three steps, okay? So this is really all you need to know for USMLE or Comlex. So let's go back up one at a time, going through these steps. We'll talk about the different enzymes. And we'll talk about what's different between gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. So the first step is actually a two-parter. It converts pyruvate into oxaloacetate. And the enzyme that does this conversion is pyruvate carboxylase. The second mini step within this first step is to convert oxaloacetate into phosphoenolpyruvate through the enzyme phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase. So big picture here, the first step is to get pyruvate to phosphoenolpyruvate. And depending on what review source you're using or what question bank you're using, you might see that abbreviated as PEP, PEP, phosphoenolpyruvate. So pyruvate to oxaloacetate and then oxaloacetate to phosphoenolpyruvate. Now the next step occurs later on, so it's not right above PEP. That's why I made the little arrow have the dashed sign. So somewhere back up, as you continue to progress back up, you have another major difference between gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. And in this one, you're starting with fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and you're converting it to fructose 6-phosphate. So you're kind of just chopping off that one phosphate. 
The enzyme that does this is fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Now, by and large, I'm a big believer in trying to make things stupid and simple. If you look at what you're starting with, which is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and what you're ending with, fructose 6-phosphate, you're really just dropping that one phosphate, like I said. So the enzyme fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase should make perfect sense because you're tasing off that one phosphate. So now you've got fructose 6-phosphate and somewhere going back up, the last major difference between gluconeogenesis and glycolysis is you start with glucose 6-phosphate and you convert it back to your desired target of glucose using the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase. So guys and girls, these three steps which you see within these gray boxes are the only difference between gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. And if you want to think big picture here, the reason why there's only these three steps that are different is because the body needs gluconeogenesis when it's in a period of fasting. And in a period of fasting, there's not readily available ATP to be used to synthesize glucose through gluconeogenesis. After all, the whole reason that the body even wants to synthesize glucose is because it needs to maintain euglycemia so that we can make glucose out of a non-carbohydrate source to then in turn use that glucose to make more ATP and to continue to power the cells in our body even in the absence of a carbohydrate source. So because of that, the body has very specially evolved these three or four enzymes in gluconeogenesis to provide a system of checks and balances. As you might imagine, if gluconeogenesis was just going all the time, not requiring specialized regulation at these checks, then the body would be wasting a lot of energy. And the idea is that the body's in a fasting state already. It needs more energy. It can't just be silly willy doing gluconeogenesis. So these enzymes are extremely important in protecting the cells and protecting the very limited, scarce amount of glucose that's in the body and in turn of ATP that's in the body. So big picture, lactate or alanine can be converted into pyruvate as well as some other precursors and then pyruvate can go back all the way up to glucose to provide a glucose source from a non-carbohydrate origin to power the cell and make more ATP. Now, for USMLE or Comlex, what you absolutely need to memorize, and it's the most important thing in this video today, is that fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is the rate-limiting step of gluconeogenesis. On these exams, the writers love to ask you what the rate-limiting step is, so you absolutely need to know that F1,6-BP is the rate-limiting enzyme of gluconeogenesis. The other thing that's important to know is the regulation of these enzymes. So on the right side of this slide, I'm going to fill in the regulation now. At fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, that enzyme is activated by citrate, but it's inhibited by AMP and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and AMP should make a bit of sense if you think about what's really happening. In the fed state, after, the, after somebody were to eat, you would undergo glycolysis because you'd have readily available glucose that can be broken down. And recall from glycolysis, go watch my glycolysis video if you need to have this explained more, but in glycolysis, you see increased levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So it should make sense to you that if there's fructose 2,6-bisphosphate lying around, it's going to inhibit an enzyme involved in gluconeogenesis because it promotes glycolysis and you don't want both of those pathways acting at the same time that would just make no sense at all down for phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase that step requires gtp and at pyruvate carboxylase that step requires biotin additionally acetyl coa activates pyruvate carboxylase and if you think about it citrate and acetyl coa are both involved in inhibiting glycolysis so it should make a little bit of sense that at various points in gluconeogenesis, they actually support gluconeogenesis. Lastly, the big picture regulator of gluconeogenesis is glucagon and everything that is glucagongenic. I'm probably making that word up, but what I mean by that is that 
Glycolysis happens in response to insulin. Insulin breaks down glucose and flows downward from glucose to pyruvate. And the opposite is true of glucagon. So when you don't have insulin, you have glucagon. So glucagon inhibits glycolysis and promotes gluconeogenesis. On USMLE and Comlex, much of biochemistry can be simplified by remembering that if you have insulin, you don't have glucagon. And if you don't have insulin, you do have glucagon. And therefore, if there's an enzyme that you know is regulated by either one of those hormones, insulin or glucagon, you can just think of them as opposites. Now, you understand the rate-limiting enzyme, and now you understand regulation. The last part of this, which I'm sure you've been wondering this entire time, is how do I remember this? How do I remember the three different steps of gluconeogenesis that make it unique from glycolysis. And if you take a look at what we have here, working from the bottom up or working from pyruvate back up to glucose, we have POPFFGG, POP pyruvate oxaloacetate phosphoenolpyruvate, FF for the fructoses in fructose 1,6 bisphosphate and fructose 6 phosphate, and the two Gs in glucose 6 phosphate and glucose. So my way of remembering this is that in the fasting state, when gluconeogenesis would need to occur, you're going to pop fresh Gouda, pop fresh Gouda, right? You're going to pop that fresh cheese right in your mouth because you're fasting and you're hungry. Pop, P-O-P, pyruvate, oxaloacetate, phosphoenolpyruvate, the two Fs for fresh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, and the two Gs for Gouda, the G is coming from glucose 6-phosphate and glucose. So like I said at the start of this video, not a whole lot to know for gluconeogenesis, but if you're going to take away a couple big picture ideas, it's glycolysis in reverse with the exception of pop fresh Gouda. The rate limiting enzyme is F16BP and know the regulation, which you see on the right side of this slide. That's really all you need to know. And if you're comfortable with that information, you'll get all of your questions correct on USMLE or Comlex.